Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today my guest is Alice B. Fogel, New Hampshire's Poet Laureate and a longtime fan of Bach's Goldberg Variations. A few years ago, she decided to create a poetic version of the 32 variations, complete with opening and closing arias. The result was Interval, a book of poems that captures the spirit of Bach's music and transforms it into a celebration of life itself. In the preface, Alice writes, music, a traceable construct on paper, rises off the page, passes through the senses, and leaves a lingering physical and spiritual ache beyond definition and form. The book, which won the first Nicholas Schaffer Award for Music and Literature, makes poetry do the same. One critic has described the work as revealing the voice of a poet stricken with the living perfection of a sound universe that inspires her to worship what she hears in the sound world of her own soul, poetry, as a bird might sing to the ineffable glory of the dawn. In addition to serving as New Hampshire's Poet Laureate, a post she will have until 2019, Alice also works as an academic support tutor at Landmark College. Her poems have appeared in a variety of journals and in the Best American Poetry series. She has published five books, including Be That Empty, a national poetry bestseller, and Strange Terrain, a how-to book on learning to appreciate poetry without necessarily getting it. I'm delighted to have Alice here today to talk about music and how its mathematical structure helps her poem soar. Alice, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for inviting me. You have a poem that you are going to share with us. Yes. So this poem um, is called Variation 18 and it's in the voice of the baker. Always daily in darkness deeper than the former lit room of my dreams, I rise to pre-dawn. By daybreak already, the bread side by side like cobblestones baking in the great black womb, its spirit scent ascending. That sweetness, that bitterness absorbs and then sets free. Always already, the weed in the field, hunger, rain, the stalks in the bleeding hand, grain in the mill, chaff on the ground. Grain ground until all airs banished, all spaces fill with the lighter, heavier powder of flour. Then once more in the solid dough, pushing, breath-infused, inspired, the yeast singing from the heart, always already wine alive, releasing, like some tiny muse being compressed. So the more I press, the more it rises up, soprano prayer returning to God and soon to be folded into well-oiled forms. And by day, always already, I have swallowed, steaming the broken wholeness of fresh grown loaves, the aboriginal substance, <clears throat> a language selved warm in my throat, another expanded breast's intake of air firmed in the famished flesh. As I listened, I was swept away by the sounds of the poem and the imagery. And I kept noticing that the, the word choices rise so much in that poem rises. Mm -hmm. And the reaction for me was that, oh, it's very much like a song where you get swept away in the moment and then you have to look back later and think, oh, how was that constructed? All of the poems in the book do that, which is a credit to you. But when I read the book the first time, my initial thought was, huh, why Bach? <laughs> um, it's a bit of a long story. So I had written a few books of poems before 
this one. And most of my poetry was um, was very lyrical. I walk a lot outside and mm -hmm. hike, and so I wrote a lot of poems based on nature. And I still love poems based in nature and lyrical poems. But I wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. I was just really feeling like I needed um, to challenge myself to do something different. So I wanted to start with some kind of structure, mm. and um, and maybe get outside of my own voice, so that when I looked at a poem I had written, I would be more surprised. Mm. So I um, I love music, and I thought right away that I wanted to try to borrow s the structure of music somehow. I started looking at music from around the world, traditional musics, thinking I might try to play with those, but I realized very soon that. While it was a very interesting project, it would have taken me decades to really know enough about mm. the music. Um, so I went back to the old dead white guy, <laughs> Bach. <laughs> um, and I chose this one really pretty much because it was a full length piece of music, has 30 variations and the two arias. and. Mm because he was using so many different forms of music from his time period. That gave me a lot to play with as far as varying the kinds of poetry I was going to use, different voices, different mm -hmm. styles, mm -hmm. all based on a structure that I stole but also um, invented from his structure. Because I'm sure if you decided to do the same thing, it would look totally different. Mm -hmm. It's subjective how I stole that. <laughs> So once you had the structure, did that give you a lot of freedom to play with different forms? Did it inspire you or did at times it feel constricting and, and maybe a bit overwhelming because it was such a big project? It was a big project and actually I wrote more poems than ended up in here because I had to limit to the number of variations. Um, mm. But but that was okay. Um, it. it it took about five years for me to do this. Mm. I listened to the Bach endlessly and mm -hmm. lots of different recordings of it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I, I knew that I wanted the content to have a lot to do with, um, with the ephemeral, with transitional states of being, mm -hmm. identity, voices in transition. Mm -hmm. So I was gathering up those kinds of conditions in life to use as my subject. Mm -hmm. A lot of people would associate the words you just used, interval transition, with poetry, but they might not associate the word mathematical mm. with poetry. So how do you see music as being mathematical, and does that relate to what a poet encounters when he or she is writing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's different for different poets, but um, music is a mathematical construct. And it's made up of intervals and durations. Mm -hmm. You can map it out very strictly like that, which is why Beethoven could write music even when he couldn't hear. Mm -hmm. And yet it affects us, obviously, on such a different level. So, so already right there in music, you have the topic of the material versus the spiritual, mm -hmm. which, of course, poetry is always approaching as well, mm -hmm. trying to approach. Mm -hmm. So um, was there an element of mathematics that you had to deal with when you were writing the poems? Yeah. So I. I borrowed from Bach the, the 32 measure structure. Each of the variations has 32 measures divided into halves. So there's 16 measures and then 16 measures. Mm -hmm. um, each, each half is repeated um, the way that the musicians perform it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really think I should repeat the poem. So what I did was I wrote, I kept, I made couplets so that there's a two-ness. Um, mimicking the fact that it would have been done twice. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wrote each poem in 32 lines, divided into halves of 16 each. So you see them on the page 16 and 16. And then within that framework, there's a huge variety of shapes on the page of the poems, depending on the rhythms, the speed, the mm -hmm. mood of the musical pieces. Mm -hmm. 
I've read some of your commentary online about what each poem does, and it's very technical and very precise. Yet when I read or listen to the poems, that's not what I notice at all. Mm -hmm. I am swept away. And I know what you mean when you say that music and poetry leaves a lingering physical and spiritual ache beyond definition and form. What does that mean to you, though? <laughs> well, uh, it's, that, it's that not being able to describe the feeling when we listen to music, how it lifts us or um, enters us, fills us. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something that is so moving, and yet, as mm -hmm. I said, it's, it's a mathematical construct. So um, that's inspiring. I would love to be able to write poems that would have that same effect. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. again, of course, it's subjective how we, how we do that. But isn't that also how we see ourselves, so that we have mm. these physical bodies mm -hmm. that are limited, and yet we feel that we're so much more than that. We don't feel that this is all we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that reminds me of a comment you've made that the poems in this book have a theme, and that theme, or one of the themes, is how we identify ourselves and the tension between the physical self and the true self, images that structure emotion at every level. Mm -hmm. So as you said, there is this constant tension between the two parts of our reality, mm -hmm. but the poems transcend one and really free the other. Well, language, if you think about it, you know, language is a physical thing. We, we, mm -hmm. we speak it, it comes out of our bodies, mm -hmm. um, and yet we're trying to speak about things that we can't always see or mm -hmm. touch, that are not always mm -hmm. concrete. So again, the um, language on the page is also a shaped thing, a form, mm -hmm. and yet it rises beyond that. Mm -hmm. And so when I write, I, I want to use language the same way um, a musician would use notes, to have an effect. Mm -hmm. A, a physical and yet an, also an emotional effect. Mm -hmm. That book is so rich. There are many themes in it. Would you tell us about a couple that you particularly like or that were meaningful to you? I'll try. Um, as I was, I was also trying to borrow the themes of the music. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in the variations, Bach does a lot with crossing over of hands, um, of go, moving up and down the scale. There's a lot of expanding and contracting feelings. So mm -hmm. those became themes as well. And, and that um, he also uses layers of voices. It's the Baroque fugue sort of thing in music. And, mm -hmm. So a melody might start and then another melody, this, or the same melody again on a different starting note or the same one overlapping. So I also wanted to use a lot of voices. Mm -hmm. So most of the poems are in voices mm -hmm. identified in the title and they're often speaking to somebody or of somebody. So there are these layers of identity mm -hmm. going on there. So th those are some of the other themes and also just the whole theme of transition, transitoriness, the ephemeral, mm -hmm. the, um, the way that we can't hold on to anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I loved the fact that there were so many voices in the poetry. A few, for example, the snapping turtle, the child, the snake, the girl who is on the verge of womanhood, the potter creating a form. There are so many that for me as I read it was always a surprise to see who or what I would encounter next. Mm -hmm. When you were writing the poems, did you have that same experience? Somewhat. Um, I think that I was, you know, as I was functioning in my daily life, I had three kids and, and um, some work as well to do. So um, 
meanwhile, all of these voices would come to me and swamp me and, and say, hey, what about me? Or I would listen yeah. to one of the variations and I would think, who does this sound like? What kind of a, a voice does this have? For instance, the one about the girl um, becoming a woman. Mm -hmm. To me, I hear this, um, I hear this kind of fresh young tone that sounds like it's going, mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. And she's talking to her mom she's, and she's a little fresh. Mm -hmm. But then she also has this other voice inside of her that is um, more vulnerable and more sweet. Mm -hmm. So I would hear these kinds of tones and I would match them with a person. Or sometimes I would just think of it, um, some kind of a threshold or liminal state of being and who might be there and write mm -hmm. about that person. As you were describing that process, I thought, hmm, she's really giving herself permission to be open to surprises and to be open to exploring things in a way that might not be conventional. And poetry does that so well. Mm -hmm. When you were writing the poems, did they start with a voice? Did they start with a phrase? Or was each one different in the way it presented itself? They do vary in how they come to me, definitely. Um, sometimes a phrase or an image, something I see, or a phrase out of context that takes on some really interesting little frisson <laughs> um, mm -hmm. will trigger a poem. Um, sometimes it's a voice or a character. And that was really different about this book, that I was writing almost, I was really writing fiction. So, mm. because these characters are not me. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of them as being um, living across centuries of time mm -hmm. in different places, and they're not all human. They're not even all embodied. Mm -hmm. so, um, so they came from many different sources. They may be fictional, but they also speak many kinds of truths. And each voice presents something that needs to be heard and needs to be said. Does that relate to your earlier work in any way? Hmm. I'm not sure if I could answer that. Um, most of, I don't tend to write narrative poems. Even in earlier years I didn't write narrative, I'm probably less and less narrative as I go on in life, but um, so I was basing my poems more off of imagery, sound, um, the experience of being alive. Mm. So, so doing this project really, um, really did take me away from, from that to some degree. I mean, I, I'm sure you could still find a voice behind all the voices that's still me the way that I use language, perhaps. But hopefully I'm changing that, that like the different voices do sound a little bit different from each other. Mm-hmm. Mm, they do. Mm -hmm. When you were composing the poems and figuring out how to arrange them, was that an easy process? Or did you have to sit down and really think about the structure? It evolved really gradually. I had been in a writing group before where we shared poems and I quit the group in order to write this book because I really didn't want to nail anything down for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, and I didn't want to show them to anybody, I didn't want to get feedback. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. wanted to sit with them. And so I, what I normally do is I'll write drafts in a journal or a notebook um, rework them until they, I've done them two or three times and they're a big mess and then I'll go and type them up. Mm. But I didn't type these up for about three years. Mm. I just let them sit there mm -hmm. and evolve. And then as I would write more, I would come back and see how what I was doing now might affect what I would have done with the other ones mm -hmm. so that they would feel like they were united in the themes based off the aria or the ground um, kind of format. Um, each one had to work individually, but they had to also work together. Mm -hmm. So they kept evolving, and the shapes evolved as well. Hmm. 
Now, you have written a book called Strange Terrain that helps people learn to appreciate poetry even if they don't get it. If you could share one idea or concept from that book, what would it be? <laughs> um, there, the main idea that I want to get across to people is that poems are not there for you to get them. And it's totally OK for you not to get them. It doesn't mean that there's a fault in the poem or in you or in the poet. Mm -hmm. It's that poems are trying to talk about things that are hard to talk about. And life has things like that in it. Mm. Love, death, things that, are, that we know all the time, but we still can't really understand them. Mm -hmm. And so poetry is trying to address those things. And so thank heavens that we have something like poetry to let us experience that mystery and not have to explain everything all the time. Mm -hmm. Your description of that discovery process really gives people permission to not figure things out, to just engage with the poem and develop a relationship of mm -hmm. sorts with it. Yeah. So if somebody were to say, well, I don't know how to do that. I, mm -hmm. How do you want me to relate to a poem? Mm -hmm. What would you say? Well, the book is sort of structured so that it gives um, some basic, it's an eight step program. And it gives you some basic ways to enter a poem or let the poem enter into you. And it's not academic mm -hmm. or technical. And in fact, some of it is so simple that after like two or three chapters, you're going to say, oh, I, I knew this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, if you can read, you know how mm -hmm. to do these things. So it's building up a familiarity with these are way I can, I can look at the words in a poem. What kind of words were chosen? Or what mm -hmm. are the sounds mm -hmm. of the poem? And what effect do those have? How do I feel at the end of reading the poem? Is it bringing up? thoughts mm -hmm. for me or associations? Mm -hmm. Do I see pictures in my head? Mm -hmm. And all of that is information. You're, you're getting information, which means you're getting the poem, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing about hidden meaning is really a problem <laughs> because the poem is right there, and what it's saying is right there on the page. And if other things come up, those are not hidden. Mm. They're there. You're experiencing those things. So if we could just take it from on that level, mm -hmm. um, we would already have that poem become part of us. Mm -hmm. That's a very important distinction. And it's interesting that so many people struggle with poetry because they do feel like, oh, I don't get it. Yet they don't have the same reaction when they listen to music. Mm -hmm. With music, they do let it sweep over them mm -hmm. or through them, and they respond on an instinctual level. Mm -hmm. And when people really become comfortable with poetry, they respond the same way. Mm -hmm. You want to take it in and understand it on, almost on a visceral level, mm -hmm. and then let it sift down into your consciousness. Yeah, definitely. When we listen to music, we don't say, oh, I don't get it. I think maybe one of the problems with poetry is that it uses words, and people think, well, I use words all day long. Mm -hmm. You know, I can read recipes. I can read the sports section of the newspaper. And so you come to a poem, and you think that it's going to explain things to you. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way that language is used in poetry. Yeah. So it does kind of um, send us down a different road. Mm -hmm. and maybe we just need to remember that. Mm -hmm. So the book is really saying, here are some skills or strategies. Um, but really, in the end, the last section is um, poems can still mystify you. Mm -hmm. So in the end, you have to get back to, all right, I can know all of this about how poems are made and w different things that are in them. And yet, I still might have that sense of mystery when I read a poem. And mm -hmm. I, for one, am grateful for mm. that. The mystery is part of the pleasure, really. Mm -hmm. Would you read another poem for us? OK. Let's see. So I'm going to read one that's from a, a threshold state of being. It doesn't have an identity um, instead of one that's from a speaker's voice. Um, 
Okay, it's variation 14, and it's called Here After. After what will happen has happened and is done, begin. Here in the infinity of aftermath, in the dying echo of the echo died down, in the dark patch after the last light flash, in the pain of knowledge after the knowledge of pain, in everything, every subject rhymed with the undeniable what happened now however much denied. No place beyond its blistered realm, no time outside its frame. Every word uttered wrung from it, every gesture touched with it, every expression visibly limbed with its brine. In the quickened heart of its doneness, in the radius of its eternal dissolve, never the dispelled, ever the dispelling, regardless of giving up forever the given irrelevant to forgetting, henceforth no or yes, the vast, vast after, inescapable, atmospheric, overpopulated, prehistoric continent of afterness, useless regret for, no return to, untenable, grieving over, unattainable relief from, the irretrievable, unrelivable before happened, 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 but after, after, begin, in the life hereafter, in the long obsessive moment, after the moment, after, after, after what would happen, did happen, and is done. That's beautiful, Alice. Thank you. Thank you.